Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Crosshess, the program at the print where we try and unpack the big geopolitical or regional security issue of the week. I'm honored to be joined this week by Professor Itzhak Weissman, a professor of uh, Islamic history at the University of Haifa. Um, Professor Weissman, I'll come straight to the point. We've been uh, talking in a week where large-scale bombing in Gaza has been underway, and one of the legitimizations or justifications of this is that Hamas has shown itself uh, to be a kind of uh, new Islamic state, a nihilist, violent blood cult uh, that can only be put down by force. And I thought for our viewers, we'd start by unpacking this by going back in history a little bit uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood, which was the tree from which uh, I, th I think Hamas can be said to be one of the branches. And I, 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 I was wondering if you could explain what the Muslim Brotherhood is, how it became such a potent political force over a century, and how it came to Gaza. I want first uh, to uh, condole the, all the victims of, of uh, this barbarous attack of Hamas. The reason that Israel is attacking now is because of the uh, atrocities perpetrated by Hamas that really look like ISIS-style atrocities. Uh, although Hamas is very different, at least in its ideology, in its formation, uh, from ISIS. Uh, it is indeed a branch or an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is uh, the largest uh, Islamic revivalist organization uh, in the Arab world and probably in the entire Muslim, uh, or one of the biggest in the entire Muslim uh, world. It was founded in 1928 uh, as a re reaction uh, to the conquest of the, of the imposition of colonialism uh, in the Middle East after the demise of the Ottoman Empire, the end of World War I. And its aims were to fight uh, the spread of secularism uh, in the Egyptian society where it was founded. Uh, and uh, to make da'wah, to, to spread, to, to bring the people back, the Muslim people of Egypt, back to Islam, yeah? which I mean, it's a little bit like the Tablir, or the, the South Asian right. Tablir movement, which was founded one or two years before. And, uh, but the difference is that it's fi the final aim of the Muslim brother was to restore the an Islamic state or a caliphate. And this is the origin, origins of the movement. From Egypt, it spread to other Arab countries, uh, Syria, North Africa, Iraq, uh, Palestine, even in the 30s and 40s, yes. But since then, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, the Muslim brother is an idea. That's the idea of returning to the true Islam, bringing the people back to true Islam. But organizationally, it is in each country, it is independent. And it's very flexible in its uh, uh, strategy. Yes, each country has different circumstances and uh, Muslim brothers in each country, it, it can be in one country, uh, uh, take part in the elections, and in another, like what happened in, in Gaza, in Palestine, it can become a jihadi organization. If, if I may just flesh this, uh, this question out a little bit, Professor, at the same time in other parts of the Muslim world, uh, in India you have the Jamaat-e-Islami, which uh, people will be familiar with here. Uh, in fact, Abu Lala Maududi, who is the head of the Jamaat-e-Islami, uh, clearly corresponding with Qutb, Sayyid Qutb, who fired, I think, the imagination of many generations of jihadis up till uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, these ideas perforating, sort of percolating across the Muslim world to Turkey, to Central Asia, 
what what did they mean by the idea of the Islamic State? Because in classical Muslim theology, this is not a, a very clear concept. So, so what did the Brotherhood mean by bringing people back to a to an Islamic State? Well, uh, as you mentioned, Qutub and Maududi, uh, we moved to the second stage in the evolution of the Muslim Brotherhood in the post-colonial era, when uh, indigenous states emerged, most of them ruled by uh, military officers in an autocratic manner, and they spread the nationalist, which is a secular idea, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was uh, persecuted by many regimes, and therefore it was radicalized. And the profit of this radical trend in the Arab world is Said Qutb, the Egyptian Said Qutb, and he was much influenced by Indian uh, thinkers, especially uh, Abu Al Al Maududi. I want also to uh, mention that the first uh, stage of Muslim Brotherhood that was more moderate in political terms was much influenced by Nadwi, by Abu Hassan and Nadwi of Nadwat al And he visited Egypt and he met these people. Now, the idea of Maududi was that uh, it was about a state, that the sovereignty belongs to Allah alone, and every ruler who wants to be a sovereign and the people worship him instead of God, he becomes a kafir, an unbeliever, and they should fight against him. Qutub took this idea of an Islamic state and radicalized it uh, even more. But you are uh, very much correct when you say that Islamic state is a modern idea. And much of the thinking of Maududi and of Qutub was a modern thinking. It took from European systems, from European thought, but tried to Islamize it, give it an Islamic interpretation. So we have the birth of the state of Israel. Uh, you've had a degree of conflict uh, before that between uh, Jews migrating back uh, to, to uh, what they believe was their promised land and between Arabs living over there. Nothing on the scale of what we are seeing today, but 48, uh, the Egyptian military and the, the militaries of the Arab states go to war against the new state and are defeated. Um, where does the Muslim Brotherhood, particularly in Gaza, position itself in this conflict? Does it fight on the side of the Arab armies? Uh, or, or does it see some other sort of direction uh, it should be taking it uh, taking itself? Definitely. From the very beginning of the Muslim brothers, uh, they declare that one of the aims is to exterminate uh, the Zionist entity. This is already in the 30s, 1930s. They sent an army to fight in 1948. Uh, Israeli independence is half a year after India. And yes. in the Ind independence war, they uh, sent forces before the Egyptian army and before the Syrian army. They fought against Israel already in 48. But then Israel was established and many of the Palestinians became refugees in Gaza, in the southwest or in the West Bank. And uh, there, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, became a kind of uh, under Jordan, Jordanian rule or under Egyptian rule. And they become a kind of welfare society that take care of the poor people, uh, of education. Yeah? They suppressed their political uh, agenda. But uh, they always uh, uh, and unequivocally against uh, the state of Israel and against any concession to the Jewish state. 
Looking back, uh, Professor, why do you believe uh, the the Muslim Brotherhood? You know, this this was a time, uh, the fifties, the sixties, of many new movements emerging in the region, uh, from the left to to nationalists, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, why does the Brotherhood kind of try and make its peace with the system, as it were? Is it to uh, sort of cultivate a mass base? Is it because it does not want to confront the other Arab regimes? What what was its political calculus? In this period, in, in, in my view, this is only a question of power, of what the uh, circumstances allow them to do. When they are weak, uh, so they will make more dawa, more preaching, more welfare work, more education, and they wait. Uh, when they have power then they will strike back, they will attack. And uh, this is true that uh, the, the rise of this radical wing of the Muslim brothers, actually the Muslim brothers split uh, in the 70s between the, the main group, what remained the Muslim Brotherhood that participated in elections um, and tried to uh, be part of civil society, and between the radical groups that became known as jihadi groups. Yeah, and they were no more called Muslim Brotherhood, but the origins are from the same uh, movement. Sometimes they may even fight each other. But what I want to say, in if we uh, go to see what happened in Israel, Palestine, yeah, so the these groups, the, uh, especially the jihadi groups, they fought against the Muslim governments, not against the West or against non-Muslims, but first and foremost against their own governments. That's why the assassination of Sadat, the rebellion in Syria in 1982, and other places. This is, uh, just for my Indian audience, this is Anwar Sadat who was assassinated uh, for, for making a historic peace treaty with Israel. And 82 was uh, the, the rebellion, the Brotherhood attempted against the military regime uh, in, in Syria with a, with a very bloody climax, uh, unfortunately, with many innocents killed. Uh, right. Just sorry for, sorry for interrupting you. No, that's correct. Uh, in Palestine, in the occupied territories, uh, the enemy is double. There is the PLO, the nationalist organization that claims to represent all the Palestinians and Israel, because, uh, because the country remained occupied, all other countries are independent. So the situation of uh, Muslim brothers that became in 1987 Hamas uh, is more complex than all other uh, situations. And because of Israeli uh, occupation, it was from the very beginning a jihadi organization. It was never the Muslim brother, as, as long as it was called Muslim Brotherhood, they were peaceful in, in what they did, or they focused on so social affairs. But the moment Hamas was uh, declared in the first intifada in 1987, it was from the first minute a jihadi organization. Organization. So here, here is my question to come. We come to 1987, the first intifada breaks out. And my uh, limited understanding is that neither the secular nationalists, if you like, the PLO, uh, nor uh, 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 Hamas or, or the Brotherhood were very prepared for this outburst of uh, uh, street protest. Um, but that Hamas was much more adroit and politically skillful at capitalizing on this. Uh, can, can you explain for us a little bit why they proved uh, much better equipped at grabbing on to this than the PLO? Was it because of their Dawa network and their social institutions? Uh, or was the PLO already discredited to some extent by that point? Uh, 
Yes, you mentioned already half of the the answer, but if we look back for a couple of years, the 80s, yeah, the PLO uh, was outside of the territories. All the uh, institutions of the organization were in Lebanon, especially in other Arab countries. They, were, uh, they had very limited contacts on the ground. In 82, in the Lebanon, first Lebanon war against Israel, PLO was beaten and expelled from, from the borders of Israel. It went to Tunisia. So it was very far away. And the PLO also already started to acquire the reputation of corruption, of uh, being far from the people. Yeah. Hamas was the opposite. And under the leadership of Ahmad Yassin, uh, it was part of the people, it worked with the people, it was uh, mingled with the poor in the, uh, in the uh, refugee camps. And therefore, it was the first within a few days to, to ride the tiger and to take leadership. So riding the tiger, um... The, 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 when when Oslo comes around uh, a few years after the first Intifada in 92, you have talk of a two-state solution. Uh, Hamas is not at the table uh, in any form, though it's already acquired uh, a significant shape. Looking back, and I, I, I know historians uh, uh, don't like doing this and asking these, you know, what if questions, but uh, if if Hamas, do you, do you believe that if Hamas had been given some place in the table or offered some bribe to come into the system back in ninety two, uh, the course of events would have flowed a little differently, or is that uh, is that a false hope in your view? No, definitely no. Hamas was not. On the table, it was in the buses, exploding in suicide bombings, uh, killing hundreds of people indiscriminately. Uh, in fact, uh, Hamas was against any negotiation in, with Israel. It declared that all the land of Palestine is, is a waqf, is a religious endowment. And therefore, nobody has the right to give up even an inch from Palestine. And therefore, all the forces of resistance, Hamas is the acronym of the Islamic resistance movement, yeah? Uh, all the forces of resistance to Oslo uh, gathered behind Hamas. Hamas led this uh, opposition. And the suicide bombings was the, its preferred strategy to obstruct the whole, uh, the whole process. And uh, in fact, at that point, uh, suicide bombing, suicide attacks, quite a new feature uh, in the world of terror, if, if, if you like. We had seen a little bit of it in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, but the sort of large scale use of, of this tactic was, was quite uh, new. Um, going on, Hamas and the PLO become locked in this uh, sort of a deadlock, if you like, uh, 2006, heading up to the elections that are going to happen, uh, some nudging and pushing to get Hamas onto the uh, political platform. Why do you think they agreed to contest that election? Were they certain they were going to win? Um, and if so, what did they hope for uh, from that electoral process? Well, uh... We must first uh, mention that uh, in 2000, mainly because of the disappointment from the Oslo Agreement, the part of the Palestinian uh, masses, they benefited nothing from this accord. Uh, so a second intifada erupted. There was chaos in uh, all over the occupied territories. And then Israel decided under uh, Prime Minister Sharon to disengage. And then came these elections. 
And Hamas already participated in elections in all kinds of local elections, elections to trade unions, to the student associations in the universities, and they were very popular. So they believed that they have a chance to win. And also, it sounds a bit uh, strange maybe, but uh, Hamas talked about democracy, that it wanted to uh, govern Gaza in democratic ways. It has the conflict with Israel. In this part, it is a terrorist organization yeah, or liberation of organization from their point of view, uh, a jihad organization. But they thought that if they come to power in democratic means, it enhances their legitimation. And this does already it, happened it, one time. If one more sentence, it happened one it, time in Algeria in 1992. Uh, there were elections, and then the military government, uh, there were two rounds, and after they won the first round, so the government abolished the elections and then started the Algerian civil war that was the worst. Uh, war in the 90s with hundreds of thousands of uh, casualties. Uh, Hamas uh, already had some example and it, it got the legitimacy because it, it won the elections. Two questions. How does, you know, if, if one reads the works of Koto Bomodu, the, the deep hostility to democracy uh, in the sort of uh, Islamist canon, in that in their ideological tradition, uh, it, it's almost a foundational part. You have it in many, many uh, Islamist writers afterwards also. How did they justify an election to themselves? And was this a dropping of the idea of an Islamic state which would encompass uh, of, of all of historic Palestine? Was there some a sense within Hamas that, look, we are going to have to live with uh, a two-state form uh, a solution in some form, shape, we, we have to come to terms with reality. Um, what, was there any of this thinking within, their, within, within the organization? I don't think the Muslim Brotherhood is against democracy. It is against Western style, liberal, irreligious democracy. But uh, it is for a caliphate. Uh, and what form this caliphate will take, this is, as I said, according to circumstances. So there are places where the Muslim brothers were the champions of democracy. For example, in Syria. Syria had right. a very uh, uh, turbulent history uh, of uh, the parliaments uh, uh, replaced by military regimes and against back of democracy, the Muslim Brotherhood were a party. And they contested the elections and won sometimes. And this time, by the way, both Maududi and Nadwi spent semester in the Damascus University. Fascinating. And this one, yes, and this is one of the avenues how they impacted the, the world. So I don't think they are against democracy. The uh, discussion is what democracy? You see, we are also now living, we in India, in Israel, in America, everywhere, with the attempt to make new kinds of democracies that are non-liberal, more authoritarian, more, uh, there are strong forces, but still, they all talk about democracy. Uh, so what the, the discussion among Islamists is, should we call it democracy, which is a Western institution, and maybe it's not according to the Sharia, to the rule of Allah, but we can say this is Shura, which is a uh, 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 conception from the Quran that, that uh, means consultation. And therefore, they say parliament is the house of Shura, yeah, where consultation is taken and there is 
there has never been problem to reinterpret the Quran, the Hadith, the, the stories about the Prophet in a way that suits uh, uh, contemporary needs. And this is not cheating. This is the way to make religion alive. Yeah. So that is it is relevant. So Shura is okay, and Shura is consultation. And Hamas has in its own organization a monthly Shura, a house of representatives, if you want, that are consulted. Yeah. And could could that Shura have extended to a genuine recognition of Israel. I know they come out with an amended charter, which is very, you know, there is one line here and some line saying apparently the opposite somewhere else. Uh, but but do you believe there was an opportunity then uh, for, for them to accommodate themselves to the reality of the state of Israel uh, as well? Well, what happened after uh, Hamas won the elections and drove the PLO away from Gaza. It became the sovereign. In the West Bank, Israel remained the sovereign according to the Oslo arrangement. The uh, Palestinian authorities uh, more supervised. Gaza is more autonomous, maybe independent. It's a semi-state. And Hamas became the government. So it must, on the one hand, take care of the population, take care of all the needs of the population, restore, uh, restore law and order, uh, take care of uh, everything, water, sewage, uh, uh, everything that people need. The state does. Yeah. So this is one side. The other side is the war against Israel that cannot be stopped. So what happened was that there was Whereas ups and downs or uh, rounds of fighting against Israel when Israel destroyed parts of Gaza. And then between Hamas talk about Hudna, about ceasefire, not peace, not something uh, permanent, but temporary ceasefire. And this time they got uh, uh, funding and help from outside sources, from the Arab world. The Muslim world to uh, reconstruct Gaza. And this was the policy. And it worked with the policies of Netanyahu governments. Netanyahu believed that this is a good way. You suppress the PLO in the West Bank, yeah, despite the cooperation and all the uh, agreements, security agreements and between uh, both. Uh, but the policy was to suppress the Palestinian authority and support uh, in a limited way Hamas, even supplied with money, with oil, with uh, the needs, so that Hamas will uh, uh, become moder more moderate. And the idea was that if the Palestinian Authority is strong, we have to negotiate with them about a solution the to the Palestinian problem. With Hamas, there's no talk anyway. So let's strengthen them at the expense of, of Palestinian Authority. On 7th October, two, week, two and a half weeks ago, all this strategy collapsed completely. And from what you were saying, it, it seems clear that no one should have expected uh, that Hamas would moderate itself and turn into a sort of right-wing conservative Islamic movement that would be content with municipal power. Um, it, it was yes. deeply ideologically committed uh, to, the, to the destruction of Israel, whatever the agreements were. This was a mistake. As I said before, Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, they behave according to their power. As long as Israel is strong, so Hamas will suppress itself 
and be careful not to cross the line. Yeah? They always uh, play on the edge yeah? so that Israel doesn't destroy them completely and they have power and they continue the struggle against the state of Israel. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, in my view, this was uh, uh, Hamas always, the, the, the final aim of Hamas is to destroy Israel. What will be on the way? This depends on the relations of power. And Israel was very powerful all the years and is still powerful today. But because what happened, the internal split in Israel and the behavior of the government, this attempt to weaken democracy uh, and split society, this signaled to the Hamas leaders that maybe this is the opportunity to attack. That's how I explain why it happened now. A, a question looking at the wider sort of arc of jihadist history. After 9-11, there was a lot of criticism within, within the jihadist movement of Al-Qaeda saying that, look, you guys have gone too far. And because you have gone too far, uh, the one state uh, the jihadist movement had, had, had obtained for itself, Afghanistan, uh, has now been destroyed. You have sacrificed uh, what we gained for some illusion. Uh, with the Islamic State itself, with ISIS, uh, uh, the, the, the same question, uh, issue, a surge of power, uh, and then all uh, dissolved uh, when they tried to hold on to the territorial caliphate and could not. Uh, do you believe that uh, um, uh, uh, Hamas has also crossed the line now into uh, cutting off all its escape options, that it will be destroyed? or that as a political movement, its roots are deep enough to help it survive this crisis as well? Hamas himself, as we hear from the news and many signs, uh, thinks that it crossed the lines. Uh, it believes that now Israel is weak, but it actually united Israeli society, united the military, and Israel is determined now to wipe out Hamas from the map. And the atrocities they did, which are ISIS-like, not so much Al-Qaeda, more ISIS-like, uh, give legitimacy to Israel, at least for some time, uh, until world opinion forgets about it, time to carry out this, uh, this plan. So the loss is, first of all, and mostly for Hamas, because this, this struggle is not global, like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, Daesh, but it is national, it's, uh, national Islamic, yes, religion. So Hamas, I cannot say that Israel will succeed fully in its plan. It's a war, and nobody knows what will happen at the end of the war. But if Israel win this war and uh, succeeds to wipe out Hamas, uh, there may be two scenarios, I think. Uh, one is that the Palestinian people in Gaza, especially, will be freed from this organization and from the calamities that it brings one after time on the Palestinian population. And maybe the international community will find a way to establish a more reasonable government for these poor people. And they're really poor people, not just in terms of uh, money. They are really poor people. I mean, the destiny and uh, what happened uh, uh, to them. Uh, so this is one thing. But the, this is the good option. The bad option, 
uh, or scenario might be that another force similar to Hamas or worse than Hamal will enter into this vacuum because Hamas is after it's it's an idea of the struggle of the Palestinian people. So they come from the Islamic angel. If no, it will be from the national, if not from the uh, global, you know, from somewhere else, because as long as there is no political solution to the Palestinian people, besides Israel, no way instead of Israel, as all these organizations want, or by fighting Israel, but a political solution in the side of Israel. So violence will come up again. It will never end. I also want to say that from another hand, and this is what the right wing in Israel says, is that there's no chance that these people will change the ideology of uh, making a state uh, on the ruins of Israel. I, I cannot say this is incorrect. I know this is not right and, and there's nothing to fear about. Yeah, We must look at all angles. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is one of the most enduring and complicated conflicts in the world. There is no clear-cut solution, maybe the same like the problem of Kashmir and between India and Pakistan uh, and Kashmiris themselves. Uh, there are some similarities, they also did, but it's also a very complicated solution with no clean uh, a conflict, with no clear solution. Uh, but Kashmir is on the edge of India, of huge India, and uh, the occupied territories are about half of Israel and very close. Yeah. So it's even more complex. I, 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 think, I think one of the problems many Indians have mentally of grasping uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is indeed one of numbers. Uh, we look at your numbers and we think of a small region uh, in one of our bigger cities. It's, it's mentally difficult to come to terms uh, with how intimate and condensed uh, Israel and Palestine both are in terms of space and numbers uh, and the anxieties uh, that breeds. My final question for you, um, um, uh, uh, Professor, looking at uh, what is happening in Gaza right now, do you foresee that uh, uh, Hamas will at least tactically try and withdraw or find some way uh, out of conflict? Or is this... Uh, uh, their moment uh, in the Führer bunker, as it is, where they will uh, take a last stand and 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 die and hope that uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, if if you like, uh, a Goddamerung with uh, Islamist characteristics uh, finally comes about. Well, this is a question of uh, you know, security and military. Affairs and I am professor of uh, Islamic studies. As uh, as you said, uh, I think this will uh, be determined on the ground. Uh, part of Hamas of the leadership of Hamas is already out of the country. There is the political wing uh, who operates in Qatar, especially Qatar. in Turkey, and. It is possible that Yahya Sinwar and, and other such guys uh, will join them. But uh, I think Israel will try to put its hand on everyone that uh, had a part in planning and participating in this uh, horrible massacre of civilians. And therefore, it is not sure even that those in Qatar or in Turkey are safe. Uh, thank you for making the time uh, to talk to us about these questions, Professor. And we wish you, of course, safety, uh, not only for you, but your family and loved ones also uh, in the weeks uh, that I'm sure very difficult weeks uh, that lie ahead. 
थैंक यू अगैन